is unparalleled, its mystique unequaled, its difficulty undeniable, and its legend unsurpassed. It is the diamond of American golf courses, a crown jewel setting for the coronation of the sport's reigning king. Golf's most demanding test and our national championship at one of the world's most revered courses. Simply put, nothing could be better than the 104th U.S. Open from Shinnecock Hills. Seemingly unchanged for more than a century, the majestic rolling links course at Shinnecock Hills may have been what the brilliant sports writer Jim Murray had in mind when he said, golf is not a game, it's bondage. It was obviously devised by a man torn with guilt, eager to atone for his sins. To tame Shinnecock, one must be a master of discipline and creativity. Shinnecock, at just under 7,000 yards, is short for a major, but the yardage belies the challenge and demands of the classic course. Blending into its natural surroundings, it is a behemoth test of skill and determination. And over the course of four days, the game's very best tried to slay this relentless monster. In the end, only two men would finish under par, underscoring the difficulty of the course and the determination it takes to be crowned champion. Shinnecock Hills itself is a paradox. It is exclusive with fewer than 300 members, yet it is not ostentatious. Its clubhouse, the first ever built in this country, still stands blending into nature's brilliant surroundings of sand and sea. Situated on Long Island near its easternmost tip in the village of Southampton, the first English settlement in the state of New York settled in 1640, Shinnecock Hills is a mere nine iron from some of the most remarkable real estate in the world. While the rich and famous make their annual pilgrimage to the Hamptons, for one magical weekend, the cavalcade of stars included the biggest names in golf from all over the world, and the must-attend party of the summer was indeed taking place at Shinnecock. On Thursday, the championship got underway, and just as everyone expected, the weather was a focal point and severely affected the scoring of the remarkably difficult par 70. But the effect was in stark contrast to expectations as Shinnecock, devoid of its nasty bite from howling winds and bitter cold, turned from wicked to friendly. Sticky, calm conditions at the outset provided scoring opportunities for many of the early starters. Winning a U.S. Open is the dream of every golfer, but seldom do obscure players from satellite tours make those dreams a reality. Buoyed by benign conditions, an unknown 30-year-old set a blistering early pace. David Roche had all but given up the game of golf and was on the verge of taking a job with an equipment company when he decided to give the Open one last chance. Four times earlier, he failed to qualify and had only won $4,000 in 10 Hooters Tour events for the year. But Roche not only qualified for Shinnecock, he tamed her. On a course where accuracy is critical, Roche hit 10 of 14 fairways. He held the lead for two holes at four under par after birdieing three of the first four holes. His round was also highlighted by a marvelous sand save for par on the menacing seventh hole en route to a brilliant two under 68. That's a nice save. Tiger Woods, the world's number one ranked player and owner of 40 PGA Tour titles, including eight majors, struggled in the opening round. The 2000 and 2002 Open champion, who has been tinkering with his swing all season, continued to have difficulty off the tee and hit only five of 14 fairways. His frustrations were obvious. Tiger failed to capitalize on the tame conditions and carded only one birdie, which was more than negated with three bogeys. He finished the day at 72, two shots over par in the hunt, but not among the leaders. Tiger and everyone else, however, were chasing a somewhat unlikely early round leader. Jay Haas was clearly not having a senior moment during Thursday's opening round, especially on the par 311, which he birdied to put him three strokes under par. Haas, at 50 years young, came to Shinnecock playing some of the best golf of his career, but still in search of his first major title. His best ever finish in a major coincidentally took place at the 95 Open, played on the same course when he tied for fourth. After missing a golden opportunity to pick up another stroke on 16, Haas had a terrific tee shot on the 179-yard par 317. That set him up to make his fifth birdie on the round and put him to four under. 
Haas made his easy par putt at 18 and finished his remarkable opening day round of 66, four under par, and he went into the clubhouse with the early lead. But Haas would have to share that lead with two other men, including quite possibly the greatest golfer ever to emerge from the land of the rising sun. Shigeki Maruyama was seeking to become the first Japanese golfer to win a major, and he kept in virtual lockstep with Haas. When he followed Haas's birdie at 11 with one of his own, he was tied for the lead at three under through 11. Maruyama, who nearly missed his tee time due to a stomach ache, showed no ill effects at the treacherous 16th, where he came up with this beautiful chip shot, leaving himself in perfect position for a birdie, which he indeed made. That dropped him to four under par with just a hole to play. Shigeki, who missed the cut in two of his three previous open starts, sank his par putt at 18 to remain in a tie atop the leaderboard with a surprising round of 66, four under. One of the pre-open favorites was the three-time major champion from South Africa, the Big Easy. Ernie Els, however, got off to a disastrous start, three over par after three holes, before he flashed the genius that made him the 1997 U.S. Open champion. Here at the par 317th, with an eight iron, Els hits a beautiful tee shot. He would convert the birdie to get back to plus one. Then at 18, the world's second-ranked player showed he can scramble as well. After a long bunker shot to the green, Els buries the par saver for four. Playing the front side as his second nine of the day, Els birdied the fifth hole and wound up at even par. He was an imposing figure lurking near the top of the leaderboard. Just two strokes off the pace is one of the models of consistency on the PGA Tour, Jeff Maggart. Maggart, one of the most accurate golfers on tour, hit 15 of 18 greens in regulation and carted a solid opening round of 68, two under par. Another short game specialist looking for his first career major victory is journeyman Fred Funk. The 48-year-old is one of the more well-liked characters on tour. Here at the ninth, his body language helps him birdie the hole and levels his score at even par. But Funk's putter was just warming up. Here at the 10th, he needed a little bit of luck. His putt would have gone way past the hole if it hadn't dropped for yet another birdie. That dropped him to one under. Then at 11, after back-to-back -back birdie putts, he scores his third consecutive birdie in a more unconventional way by holding out from the bunker. That dropped him to two under and prompted him to toss the ball as a souvenir to a lucky fan. Then after par is at 12 and 13, Funk came up with his tremendous approach shot at 14, leaving him with an easy opportunity for another birdie. Funk sank the birdie putt and would finish his up and down round at even par 70. The former number one player in the world is David Duvall, who chose the Open for his comeback event after walking away from competition nearly nine months before. And for a moment, it looked as if nothing had changed as he birdied the first. But then things began to unravel. He was forced to take penalty strokes on both the fourth and fifth holes. He carted nine bogeys and three doubles en route to a 13 over par, 83. Yet the 2001 British Open champion was thrilled to be back in competition and seemingly undeterred by his high score. Also making a comeback was the reigning US Open champion, Jim Furyk. Thursday's round was his first since he was sidelined by a January wrist surgery. Just like Duvall, he birdied the par four first. Furyk, not as rusty as Duvall, wasn't quite able to master the course. He shot identical front and back 36s and finished the opening round of the Open with a respectable plus two 72, and in a good position to at least make the cut. No one's comeback in this year's Open was any more startling, any more dramatic, and any more needed than the return to the scene of Corey Pavin's greatest golf triumph. It was the shot heard round the golf world when Corey Pavin hit his now famous forward on the final hole of the 95 U.S. Open on the same course at Shinnecock. He was just moments away from never again being referred to as one of the greatest golfers never to win a major. Instead, he would forever be introduced as U.S. Open champion Corey Pavin. Pavin's U.S. Open championship was by far his greatest victory and it fulfilled a lifetime dream but it also signaled a dramatic turning point in his career. 
he returns here to Shinnecock, the site of his magical memory, with just one PGA Tour victory since his last visit here. But on this day, despite the shorter and graying hair color, Pavin seemingly turned back the clock. He began on the back nine and jumped out to a quick start, sinking a birdie at 11 to go to two under. After a par at 12, he continued his assault on one of his favorite courses with another birdie in the short par 4 13, which dropped him to two under. Then at 18, where he hit the greatest shot of his life nine years ago, Pavin would hit a less than magical shot. Instead of a remarkable forward, he sent this long iron past the green and into a bunker. But still capable of flashing genius with his short game, he made this great bunker shot, getting in position to save par and finish his first nine holes at one under. Pavin went right back to work on the par four first, sinking this putt for his third birdie of the day. It put him just one shot behind the leaders at two under. But just as Pavin had been shining bright, rain clouds and a thunderstorm settled in, halting play for two hours and 12 minutes. When the weather improved enough for play to resume, it was an amateur, Spencer Levine, who would bring the crowd to a thundering roar with this eight iron on the 179 yard 17th. The hole in one was the first of his life at a thrill of a lifetime. Levine finished his round at 169. But he had to share the spotlight with another amateur, Bill Haas. With his father, Jay, the co-leader of the championship watching, the younger Haas finished the opening round at two over, six shots behind his father. Another son of a famous tour player was among the leaders, striking an uncanny resemblance to his father, 1982 Masters champion Craig Stadler, son Kevin finished the first round tied with eight others at two under 68. One of those golfers in that log jam is the reigning Masters champion and crowd favorite, Phil Mickelson. 2004 had been a watershed year for the already heavily decorated Southpaw. In addition to winning the much coveted green jacket at Augusta and enjoying all the pageantry fit for the king of golf, Mickelson entered the open with a new attitude, a more relaxed disposition, and the confidence of a champion. At the 12th, Mickelson showed his fine touch with a putter, giving him his first of three opening round birdies to put him at one under. He played bogey-free golf through his first 15 holes in large part because he was able to stay focused when he was in trouble and not go for heroic shots as he did when he was younger. And Argentine Angel Cabrera was making a name for himself. Cabrera was looking for his first win on the PGA Tour after just two European victories. He birdied the difficult 474-yard par-4 sixth. Then, just two holes later, he sank another birdie putt at eight to put him at four under for the opening round. He was in a three-way tie for the lead with Haas and Marayama before the fog rolled in and halted play for the day. 19 groups still on the course would have to finish their opening rounds the following morning. At the completion of the first round, Shinnecock had yielded better than expected scores, with Haas, Marayama, and Cabrera in a three-way tie for the lead at four under. Pavin 67 left him just one shot off the pace. Nine golfers were two shots back, including Mickelson, VJ Singh, and Jeff Maggard. The fog and rain lifted for Friday's second round, and Shinnecock's dreaded wind was still not much more than a light ocean breeze. But the weekend's forecast was calling for increasing gusts, which translates into presumably higher scores. So the golfers were not only scrambling to survive the cut, but to weather Shinnecock's storm by posting as many red numbers as possible. First round co-leader Angel Cabrera played the back nine first and assumed sole possession of the lead at five under with his birdie on 16. However, he would give that shot back and more at 18, missing his bogey putt. The double dropped him to three under. Cabrera had a rocky front nine, but at the par five fifth, he sank the 20 footer for an eagle three and wound up the day at three under. One of the two men with whom Cabrera shared the opening round lead, Jay Haas picked up right where he had left off the previous day. His approach at 10 left him with just a 10 foot putt. And he read the break perfectly and birdied his opening hole. 13 was not a lucky number for Haas though. His putt lipped out of the hole for a bogey. 
Thursday's opening round magic had worn off for the 50 year old. At 16, his uphill birdie putt stopped just short, forcing him to settle for par. And then again at 18, he came up just a little short, this time for par. And Haas finished the day four over, but even for the championship. Things were a little better for Jay's son, Bill, trying to become half of only the second father-son duo to ever make the cut at a U.S. Open. Haas's approach at 16 left him with an easy putt for Eagle. He carted a round of 73, finishing the first two rounds at plus five, just good enough to stick around for the weekend. Green side, beautiful long bunker shot. Making the cut was not the goal for Phil Mickelson. Winning the open was. At eight, his birdie got him to four under par. There we go, Mickelson moves to four under par. This is seven iron for Phil. The reigning Masters champion was on fire, hitting 11 of 14 fairways and an astounding 15 of 18 greens in regulation, en route to his bogey free second round. At the 12th, Mickelson sank this 12 footer for his third birdie of the day and dropped him to five under. At the par 5 16th, the hole that has haunted him for nearly a decade, Mickelson got out of trouble. This fine bunker shot left him with an easy three footer for birdie, and he finished the day with a four under 66. And at the time, he led at six under for the championship. Always a bridesmaid, never the bride, Jeff Maggart set out to change that U.S. Open tradition. He was at one under for the day when he stepped up to the short par 311. He would get a great bounce off the left edge of the green, and a great roll left him just a few feet, which he then made for birdie. Maggart played bogey-free golf on the backside and carted two birdies, including this one at 16. His 67 left him just a shot off the pace at five under. Fred Funk was trailing Mickelson by three when he got things going. At eight, he stuck his approach shot to within just a couple of feet for an easy birdie. Then at nine, he made it back-to-back -back birdies when he just barely tapped this putt and watched it roll and roll slowly all the way in. A 66 for Funk, and he was safely in at four under for the championship. Like Funk, 2001 Open champion Retief Goosen started the day at even par and then got hot. The 20-footer on the par 5 16th for his third birdie of the day. Goosen needed only 26 putts, making five birdies against just one bogey and wound up with a round of 66. Four under for his two-day total. Goosen's fellow countryman Ernie Els made par on the first four holes before his blade caught fire. That for birdie at the sixth, but he was far from done. On the very next hole. His touch right now is off the charts. That's in. Oh! And his momentum continued. After another birdie at seven, the Big Easy would make it look easy with his fourth birdie in a row, and he finished the front side in four under. At 13, Ells chipped from just short of the green and nearly came up with yet another birdie. He would settle for par. The day's only blemish would come at 14, when his putt barely missed. The bogey dropped him to three under. And that's the way he would finish. His round of 67 put him in fine position for the weekend at three under. After starting the second round with three pars and a bogey, that old Corey Pavin magic reappeared at five. Come on, go! That birdie put Pavin back to three under. His tee shot narrowly missed the greenside bunker at seven, and his chip to the much feared Redan hole just rolled past the edge of the hole leaving an easy par putt and Haven in disbelief. Always a great finesse player, he rolled in a downhill putt at nine for birdie and finished the day one over, two under for the championship. Lefty Mike Weir had an up and down round Friday, three bogeys, a double and five birdies, including this one at the par 311. 
when he came up just inches from a hole in one. I guess that makes my point. At 16, Weir carded another birdie, his last, shooting an even par round of 70 to remain at one under. In addition to Els and Goosen, another South African was in the hunt. Thanks in part to this brilliant chip, Trevor Immelman followed up his opening round 69 with an even par round of 70 to stay at one under. Defending champion Jim Furyk found himself flirting with missing the cut. He was at plus six before blasting in for eagle at the par five 16th. One hole later, he faced this downhill right to left putt, but he stroked it just hard enough to roll in for the birdie, and Furyk made the cut at plus four. Is it hard enough? Oh, man. <laughs> Golfing great Tom Kite took a road unfamiliar to get himself to Shinnecock. At 54, he continues to play a high level of golf. The well-respected Texan who won the U.S. Open at Pebble Beach in 92 had to earn a berth this year in a sectional qualifying event in his home state just a week prior to the Open. Kite was in good shape after Thursday's 72 and in better shape Friday at 5, where his chip from just short of the green narrowly missed going in for eagle. Kite made birdie to get to plus one. He then sank a birdie putt at 11 and finished the day with a round of 71, satisfied for surviving Shinnecock and making the cut. <laughs> However, failing to qualify for the weekend was David Duvall. He had the second highest total of all players, but left Shinnecock upbeat about his game and leaving everyone to wonder when we would see him again. Making the cut and Tiger Woods are not generally found in the same sentence, but this is Shinnecock, and Tiger couldn't tame her. He got off to a horrible start at 10, badly missing the fairway, and with bogey his opening hole. Tiger had to scramble all day as he flirted with missing the cut, but at 16, he got this great pitch shot to help him save par. And then two holes later, he was in the rough at 18, when he came up with yet another of his patented magical shots to once again save par. We get it back there. <laughs> what a four this would be. But then Tiger got hot. After 13 holes without a birdie, he sank a 20-footer to get to two over. Tiger only hit 10 of 18 greens in regulation, but luckily for him, his putting stroke was sharp. He needed only 27 putts on the day, one at six for back-to-back -back birdies. His short game was his saving grace, and he was able to survive his 32nd consecutive cut in a major, and after two rounds, he stood at plus one. Tiger's playing competitor had no such concerns about failing to make the cut. Shigeki Marayama, one of the three first round leaders, continued his brilliant play. The terrific approach led to a birdie at 13. Maruyama hit 11 of 14 fairways and 13 of 18 greens on Friday, and when he chipped in for birdie at 17, he improved to six under and a share of the lead. But then at the second, his 11th hole of the round, he missed his par putt, giving him his first bogey of the championship. But he got back on track at the very next hole. The birdie at the par three third put him back into a first place tie at six under. His putt at the fifth wasn't his best of the day, but it was for Eagle, and it left him with an easy birdie putt that he made to drop to seven under. Then at the ninth, his final hole of the day, Mariyama nearly sank the par-saving pitch. Instead, he bogeyed the hole and carted a two-under round of 68. So midway through the 104th U.S. Open, there was a tie for the lead at six under between Mariyama and Mickelson. Just a shot back was Jeff Magger. Fred Funk and Retief Goosen were tied at four under, two strokes behind the leaders. First round co-leader Angel Cabrera and Ernie Els were tied at minus three. Others included BJ Singh and Corey Pavin at two under. Mike Weir and Trevor Immelman were the only other golfers to beat par. Some other notable scores included Sergio Garcia, Jay Haas, and Kevin Stadler at even par, Tiger Woods led a contingent at plus one.
Only 36 holes remained before the cheers for another champion would be heard over the windswept hills of Shinnecock. I guess patience and hard work and waiting, <laughs> I guess it pays off. Watch out for this one. This is a shot of his life. It's really a fabulous test of golf, and it has withstood the test of time. In my view, Shinnecock is without question the number one championship golf course in the world. I could see playing this golf course, you know, the rest of my life and not playing anywhere else and being quite content. It's a land with an unmistakable aura, where time stands still, and a championship tradition spans more than a hundred years, where the passionate quest for golf's national championship is reflected in the men who have won here. Where Raymond Floyd pushed his 43-year-old body and mind into a trance-like state. That week, 18 years ago at Shinnecock, still defines his career today. And that shot, nine years later, has followed Corey Pavin every day since. Forward, 228, U.S. Open champion. Forever a part of the tapestry of legends. Open Championship of the United States of America. I consider myself exceedingly lucky to have won this championship. Little Ben Hogan captures top honors today. A sensational rally in open golf history. Oh. I've been dreaming of this moment since I was 10 years old. <laughs> I just felt that today I had to do it. It was uh, probably my last chance. Open champion is now the people's champion, Jim Deering, the 103rd U.S. Open champion. This weekend, on this windswept landscape, someone else will look deep within their character and become one with the spirit and soul of Shinnecock. Saturday, Shinnecock Hills was sun-drenched, which means the course was getting outright nasty. This was not the kinder, gentler golf course the world's best golfers had played the first two rounds. With the wind making its return to the course, the only thing faster than the lightning-quick greens were the number of bogeys piling up as just three players managed to break par on the day. And much of the heartbreak took place on a hole more famous for its name than its number. The Redan Hole, Shinnecock's par 3 7th. The origin of the Redan Hole comes from the 1885 Crimean War, when Redan became a military term for a fortified position and now is used to describe a golf hole in architectural terms. The Redan Hole is golf's most often imitated, and at Shinnecock on Saturday, it was the most lethal on the course, due in large part to the speed of the green and the steep slopes of the putting surface itself. One needs to look no farther for proof of the difficulty the players had Saturday at seven than Ernie Else, who three-putted the hole. Boy, what a next putt that's going to be if it stops. If it stops. Man, is that if it stops, go? That might that pick up speed. just hard to believe. That is gone. This hole is just off the charts right now, literally. Well, the best little four-par in the world right now. Corey Pavin at seven hit what looked like a spectacular chip shot. Oh, he 
He's got such marvelous touch. That just did a big, huge circle around the hole, folks. Look at this and it's screen. still moving. How unbelievable is that? Oh, this green's getting a oh, little, little man. He would go on to make par on the hole, yet remain in disbelief. He seemed to recall the year 1995 when his short game was one of the game's best. Great touch at 16 for a near eagle, and Haven would finish with a third round of three over par. Playing in the shadow of countryman Elson Goosen is Tim Clark, who made a name for himself Saturday. This spectacular approach at five nearly went in for double eagle. Clark fired a 66, low round on this difficult day, and one under par after three rounds. Tiger Woods got off to yet another rocky start. After bogeying two of the first three holes, he made a great approach at the fourth, but he failed to make the short putt and settled for par. It is. All right, good call, Ed. Then at the very next hole, Tiger hit an aggressive tee shot with his driver on the par five fifth. And like he had all week, he sliced it into the right rough. Frustrations were evident on the normally unflappable superstar. Then coming off a of birdie at eight, Tiger from 89 yards short of the elevated ninth. He sent his approach past the pin, but the wind and his backspin helped bring the ball back and Tiger saved par and finished the front nine one over for the day. The par four 412 yard 10th is one of the most unusual holes at Shinnecock. The approach to the green is often from about 120 yards to a severely elevated green. The safe play is to the center of the green, as anything short will roll back down the steep banks of the hill and right back to the golfer's feet. Back in 95, Ben Crenshaw, who had one of the best short games that golf has ever known, was a victim of the 10th. His chip shot landed just on the false front of the green, and he could do nothing but stand and watch as his ball would slowly trickle down to where he stood in utter disbelief. Crenshaw tried again to chip the ball and run it up the hill, and again he fell prey to the hole. He would wind up taking a triple bogey seven, and his body language spoke volumes of his frustration of being virtually eliminated from contention of the 95 Open. Saturday, Tiger Woods shared more than just a green jacket with Crenshaw. We've seen balls come up short and spin back like, like, that. like that. Look at Tiger. Look at him looking oh, down. Man. Doesn't even want to watch it. He will not watch it. That ball will trundle back down the hill a good 30 yards or so. It's tougher now than the shot he just had, right? This will be long. Yeah, I was just going to say, he's running that up. Oh, he's going to run it up and come right back down oh, again. Man. Tiger would score a double bogey six on the hole and would balloon to plus six. I almost think he did it just because he thought it was a cool shot. However, he would erase the double bogey at 18. Very strange spot. He hit his drive, but he can't really see from there. Oh, Tiger. <laughs> Hasn't had his game all week. Tiger would finish the day with a 73 and a rocky three-day total of four over par. Says Stevie, pack it on in. I'll take this one up. VJ Singh started the day in contention at two under, but hit only six of 14 fairways and five of 18 greens Saturday to shoot a seven over 77, virtually eliminating any hopes he had of a Saturday charge. Shinnecock had humbled and exasperated the Fijian champion. Jeff Maggard started the day just one stroke behind Mickelson and Marayama, but served notice he was ready to challenge for his first major with a birdie at the second to go to six under. Then at the par four fourth, Maggard had a chance to seize sole possession of the lead thanks to this great approach, which left him a short putt for birdie. He would later miss, though, and stay at six under. Fred Funk surrendered two strokes with bogeys to start his round, but got one back with that birdie at the fourth, putting him at three under. Ratif Goosen bogeyed the second hole Saturday, and then at five, he hit a beautiful approach shot and two putted for a birdie. His assault on the leaders and a second open title continued as he was then at four under. Maruyama, who shared the lead after 18 and 36 holes, vaulted back into a tie for the lead at the fourth. His birdie putt put him back to six under. Five different men would hold the lead outright Saturday, including Jeff Maggard, whose bunker shot left him a short putt for birdie. He was at seven under and in sole possession of the lead. After Phil Mickelson left his approach at five short, he made this nice pitch, leaving him an easy birdie putt he later sank, and he trailed Maggard by just one at minus six. 
Funk, meanwhile, picked up another birdie at five to get back to four under, and then scrambled to get into position for his par-saving putt at six. He was happy to walk off, not bogeying the hole. Has to get out of there in a hurry. Maggard's sole possession of the lead was short-lived. On the sixth, he missed the par putt and fell into a three-way tie for the lead at six under. Then at seven, Goosen for birdie. I haven't seen many putts from this angle. See Corey Pavin. Watch this. Big Watch this. Turn around got it. That's got a good chance. Finn. Oh, just like Corey's. Oh. Look at this. <laughs> Goosen would make par and stay at four under. Maggard at seven to go back alone at seven under. Square a little right. He's playing the break. Oh, look at this shot. That's, that could go in. He would have to settle for par and stay at minus six. Then it was Mickelson's turn at seven, where he hit what looked like a good tee shot. But on the Redan hole, looks can be deceiving. That's going to be a good spot. It's going to be chipping right up the fall line. Uh, so he's, that's not bad. It's not bad at all. Mickelson's second shot left him closer to the hole, but in worse shape. A golf contradiction on any other course. Not the greatest lead right there. That is back there. Well, I see it. Well, that's going to be the, probably the fastest putt of his life. But Mickelson's nightmare on seven was far from over. There, Mickelson with two putt for a double bogey and test his new steel will and even disposition. He dropped to four under. After a bogey of his own at the Redan, Maruyama came up with a great putt to save par and avoided back-to-back -back bogeys. He stayed at five under, just one shot off the pace. Goosen, who finished the front nine with four straight pars, didn't succumb to the same fate as Tiger at the tenth. Instead, hitting up and over the steep ball's front and landing safely on in regulation. But he was left with a tricky downhill putt that nearly ringed out of the hole but fell in for a birdie. And Goosen was now also at five under. Else coming off a frontside score of one over on the day. Yes! Got that misstep back at the 11th. Fred Funk was at three under when he stepped up to his tee shot with a seven iron at the par 311. I'd say that's pretty good. The birdie would take him to four under, two shots back. While Funk was on his way up the leaderboard, Marayama was sliding down. He made a great attempt on his long second at the par 311, but would wind up three putting the hole, making bogey, and dropping out of the lead at four under. That's way better than average. On the very next hole, Funk surged into a tie for the lead at five under. Oh, I don't think he thought it was gonna go in. Goosen shared the lead, but then he faltered on the not-so-lucky 13th. Just a little bit. That miss led to a bogey for Goosen and put Funk all alone in the lead. On the next hole, Goosen with a very uncharacteristic miss of an easy putt for his second bogey in two holes, and he fell to three under. But after Funk bogeyed 14, Goosen reclaimed a share of the lead by making the 20-footer for birdie to take him to four under. Mickelson was tied with Funk and Goosen for the lead when he surged in front. Started it just that way. That snapped a streak of nine holes without a birdie for Mickelson and put him all alone in the lead at five under. But he barely had time to savor the outright lead as Goosen followed back-to-back -back bogeys with back-to-back -back birdies. His second there on 16 gave him a share of the lead. At 16, Funk, who was known for his short game, made a costly mistake. His chip from just in front of a greenside bunker went just a few feet right into the bunker. The 16th could have been a total disaster, but Funk sank this 12-footer to save Bogey, dropping him to three under par. Then at 17, he showed why he's one of the top bunker players on tour. He made par on the hole to remain at three under, but looked as though Shinnecock had worn him out. After making par at 17, Goosen stuck his approach from just under 100 yards away. An easy shot, really. There it is. Goosen's having a great finish. 
but that great finish came up a little short when Goosen missed his easy birdie. He finished the day with a round of one under, five under for the championship. Then at 17, Mickelson second from the bunker. What a shot. Oh. The shot left him an opportunity to save par, but he barely missed the putt, a foreshadow of things to come. Nope, gonna do it. At 18, with Mickelson's smile now nowhere in sight, he missed the easy par and finished with back-to-back -back bogeys. His playing competitor, Marayama, limped home as well, missing an easy bogey putt and closing his round of 74 with a double, leaving both 36-hole co-leaders demoralized. So after 54 holes, Goosen, in search of his second open title, sat atop the leaderboard at five under. Two shots back were his countrymen and boyhood rival Ernie Els, as well as the reigning Masters champ Mickelson. Fred Funk and Shigeki Marayama were three shots back at two under. Maggart, who bogeyed four of the last nine holes, was tied with Tim Clark at one under. The only other player not over par was Mike Weir at even. Corey Pavin and Sergio Garcia were at plus one, headed into the final round of the 104th U.S. Open. Today on the windswept hills of Shinnecock, this icon of American golf awaits its next champion. Men who found out how much they cared and how much it meant. Today, South Africa could leave an even bigger mark. While Ratif Goosen marches toward another title, his countryman Bernie Els eyes the rarefied company of a three-time winner. And Phil Mickelson dares to go where only a select few have, halfway to the Grand Slam. Whose turn is it today to tempt the history and magic of Shinnecock? Undoubtedly, the fabled Redan seventh hole best exemplifies the mystique and challenge of Shinnecock. After the first four golfers combined for 10 over at seven Sunday, USGA officials decided to syringe the seventh green throughout the day to give players a chance to hold the green with their tee shots. Angel Cabrera, who shared the opening round lead Thursday, took advantage of the newly slow putting surface. He chipped in for birdie and route to a 75, respectable by Sunday's standards. Jay Haas, who shared the lead Thursday with Cabrera, had an especially great Father's Day. Blasting out of the bunker on the par five. And you guessed it. Happy Father's Day. That gave him an eagle on the fifth. Then it was his turn at seven. Want to hit just right at that tower that you see, the TV tower. Only 13% of the players have hit the green today. And look at this shot. Best shot of the day, I think. Just fantastic, Jay. Haas would close out one of the best U.S. Opens of his distinguished career by shooting a 71. Haas would finish the championship in a tie for ninth at seven over. Get this trickle. Here it comes. Here it comes. Man, does that show you the speed of these greens? David Roche, one of the surprise stories from Thursday, would continue his surprising play. The long putt from just off the green at three got him to five over. Well, I bet he'll keep playing. After a bogey at four, Roche again chipping from in front of the green. And there it goes. <laughs> Roche would finish the championship at 15 over 295. Good enough for a tie for 31st. It had been a trying championship for Tiger Woods. Here at the second, his birdie chip came up short. Tiger had the second fewest birdies of the 66 players who made the cut. And just like Saturday when he eagled 18, he saved his best for last. The only birdie of the day for Tiger, in fact. Despite his round of six over, he still flashed his trademark smile. Showing respect but not fear for Shinnecock was Spencer Levine. The 19-year-old making his first U.S. Open appearance made quite an impression. Here at the difficult sixth, his approach left him an easy birdie, which got him to five over. Then at the 11th, his great sand save helped him make par. Levine would win low amateur honors and finish plus eight. It's not a pretty swing. He's Get it done. 
Clearly one of the feel-good stories of the championship was the comeback to Shinnecock for Pavin. But he would love to forget the first hole Sunday. Come right back. Nightmarish start for Pavin. That is just a brutal start, huh, Mark? Yes, can't, get, can't get any tougher than that. Look at that. It's going to roll right up against that color. Well, not too bad. I got past it. After that unsuccessful shot, Pavin grabbed his putter, determined not to repeat the same mistake. But he opened his final round with a disappointing double bogey. Pavin recovered one shot on the very next hole. Yes, indeed. But at five, he had been putting for eagle and was forced to settle for par after a demoralizing three putt. Pavin, who had started the day at one over, endured a six bogey round before an exciting finish. Okay. But that might come back, yep. The 95 champion may have finished at 10 over, but left Shinnecock beaming with pride. Mike Weir started his final round with three bogeys, but thanks to this fine approach, he would birdie the fourth and finish four over for the day and the championship. That's as good as you can do. There's a big hill there in front of the hole. You can't get close. The distinction of low round on Sunday went to Robert Allenby, who had the hot putter. Oh, yeah. So Allenby. Allenby was the only player Sunday to match par, and that helped him finish tied for seventh at six over for the championship. Jeff Maggard started the day four shots off the pace as he hoped to win that first major. Great, look it up nicely. Wow, what a shot. Is it in? Oh! That birdie at the first dropped him to two under. After bogeys at two and four, he got back on track at five. He would birdie the hole to get back to minus one. Then, at the lightning fast seven, facing a big right to left break, he sank his par putt to stay in the hunt at one under. Then for birdie at nine. Coming off double bogey at the eighth to drop to plus one and just charges that one home. After making the turn at just one over, he made bogey at 10, but got that shot back at 13. Happy Father's Day, that one goes in. After a birdie at 17, he missed the easy par putt on the final hole and finished his round two over, giving him his seventh top 10 finish in the last 11 opens. Shigeki Marayama's quest to become the first Japanese golfer to win a major was still alive when he birdied the fifth to go to one under. But he would endure eight bogeys on the day, including where else but on seven. He finished with a final round 76, dashing any hopes of winning the U.S. Open. Bob Costas would set the scene for what would be a classic finish to an unforgettable championship. There are only four men yet to tee off for the final round at Shinnecock. They include the playful 47-year-old Fred Funk, a five-time winner on the PGA Tour. Funk has never won a major. Playing with Funk is the people's choice, Phil Mickelson. Mickelson has evoked cheers with every walk down these fairways. It seems he and the fans haven't stopped enjoying Lefty's major breakthrough at Augusta. One golfer who didn't see that putt, but certainly heard and felt its result, will be in the final pairing today. Ernie Els, whose bid for a third different major was crushed by Mickelson's birdie, is now in position for his third U.S. Open title. Paired with Els is another South African and another former Open champion, Retief Goosen. Holes remain in pursuit of the 104th United States Open Championship. Mickelson, who turned 34 earlier in the week, wanted nothing more than his second major win. He thought he had birdied the first, but watched as it just trickled past, and he made par to stay at three under. 
Playing in the final group was Ernie Els. The two-time Open Champions bid for a third literally took an immediate U-turn. He mishit his chip shot at the first, and the ball slid off the back of the green and rolled all the way back down. And Els started with a double bogey. Ratip Goosen, who grew up boyhood friends and competitive rivals with Els, fared better at the first. That birdie put Goosen in front at six under. At the third, Funk was determined not to commit the golf sin of leaving his birdie putt short. He nearly sank the firmly struck putt, but when it just missed, it would roll off the green and Funk would cart his second straight bogey. Then at the Redan, things went from bad to worse for Funk. His miss hit would cost him dearly, a double bogey, and his score had soared to plus three. He made the turn five over for the day and bogeyed 10 before making his first birdie of the round at 12. <laughs> then from just off the green at 13, he came up with this shot to save par. That kept him at five over for the day and three over for the championship. Funk hit only five greens at regulation Sunday and was forced to scramble all day. One of the high points of his otherwise trying day came at 16. He would make Rudy there but finished seven over on the day and well behind the leaders. Meanwhile, Els was clinging to his hopes. Here at three, he became just the third player all day to birdie the hole and went to two under par, three strokes behind Goosen. But then after bogeys at four and five, a bad bounce at the Redan effectively eliminated Els from the championship. It's a hop, sharp hop left. Watch this, just rolls off the back, actually almost gathers speed at this point. It's just hard to believe uh, these greens. Ernie's bogey at seven was one of four to go with four doubles, and he shot a round of 10 over, plus seven for the championship. Now the 104th U.S. Open was virtually match play between former champion Ratif Goosen and reigning Masters champion Phil Mickelson. Mickelson at the fourth. That birdie got him to three under. But then Mickelson squandered a great scoring opportunity when his eagle punt from just off the green at the fifth rolled well past the hole and he settled for par to stay at three under. Meanwhile at the fifth, the even-tempered Goosen sank this tricky downhill putt to save par and maintain his two-stroke lead. His trend of sinking character-building putts to save par continued at six. Nicely done. That was the club that really won in the Open in 2001. At seven, a bad sand shot could have spelled disaster for Mickelson, but the clutch sand save ensured par at the Redan, and Mickelson still trailed Goosen by two. Then at eight, a par-saving putt of his own for Mickelson to stay at three under. Good stroke. But at 10, his par putt just missed right. And Mickelson would fall to two under. At 11, he came up with another putt to save par and coupled with a bogey at 10 by Goosen, and the lead was cut to just one. But then Goosen stepped up to the tee at the par 311. He's hit this ball high, he's turning it right to left. Left of the hole. He would make birdie and take a three-stroke lead over Mickelson, who had bogeyed the 12. Then at 13, Mickelson stepped up to his approach shot, badly needing a birdie. That's a good play, it hit right in that mound. Well done, he did his, he did his homework. The birdie at 13 would put Mickelson back to two under and just two strokes behind Goosen. And at 13, Goosen was in trouble. That is a beautiful shot. Wow, what a beautiful play. His incredible shot from the rough was terrific, but saving par was no easy thing. Oh, he got in that left edge. What a par. Mickelson was still at two under, trailing by two at 15, 150 yards away. Oh yeah, oh yeah, 30 time. At 14, after a poor bunker shot, Goosen needed and got this puck to save bogey. He dropped a stroke and stood at three under. Unaware of Goosen's bogey behind him, Mickelson coolly sank his birdie putt. 
tying the championship and setting the stage for an epic finish. Tying the lead in the U.S. Open, Mickelson. Three holes left. As Mickelson walked to the tee at 16 amidst an enormous gallery, he realized it was time to put the pass behind him. Nine years ago, as a baby-faced 25-year-old, he would have won the U.S. Open if it weren't for 16. In the first round, he missed a short bogey putt and made double. And then on Friday, he showed great touch with a wedge from the rough on his fourth. But his putt just slipped out and he had to tap in for bogey. On Saturday in the third round, he again had to chip from the rough. This time, he ran it way past the green and could feel the pressure building. He was left with about a 25-footer for par. And he missed it just to the right of the hole for yet another bogey and yet another stroke surrendered at 16. Final Sunday, Mickelson's approach found the deep rough right of the green, and he hit his pitch very high, just a few feet short of the green and into the bunker. He would then chip out safely and two putt for double. A four day total at 16 of six over par, losing the championship to Paven by four. Now he stood on the tee at 16, poised to rewrite history. This one is headed down the left-hand side, just needs a soft bounce is all. His tee shot would miss the fairway and find the primary cut of rough. Not a great start. His second shot of the par five was much better. Now this one is high and left. All right, that is foul. Good friendly kick. That'll be fine. Meanwhile, back at 15, Goosen ran his amazing streak of par-saving putts to six on the day, 19 for the championship. At 16, Mickelson over the same bunkers that cost him dearly in 95. That's the way to do it, right there. Catch the slope. Come right back down to the hole. Leaves it below the cup. And then this for the lead. Yes! Mickelson to four under five. That's three birdies in his last four holes. The birdie at 16 lowered Mickelson to four under and now ahead of Goosen by one. Goosen then at 16. Sand iron here, starting right, turning left toward the hole. Pretty good looking shot. Oh, hold on. The good approach would leave him with a birdie opportunity of his own. All that remained for birdie was this 15 footer. Goosen's fourth consecutive one putt, and now he and Mickelson were tied. Man, are these guys making some putts. Up at 17, Mickelson came up with this great bunker shot, leaving him just four feet from the hole. Now he appeared to be firmly in control of his game and his emotions, and in excellent position to win the elusive and long sought U.S. Open. Mickelson three putt at the next to last hole of the championship for double, leaving him two behind Goosen and the golf world stunned. Goosen, who had been on the brink of collapse many times, also found the bunker at 17. You better get all of Oh, this looks like it's bunker bound, maybe. Oh, yes, it is. After safely hitting out of the bunker, Goosen again needed just one putt. His par at 17 kept him two shots in front of Mickelson with just one hole to play. Goosen's fifth one putt in a row. Back nine, U.S. Open. After a near perfect tee shot at 18, Mickelson needed a miracle. Beautiful flight. That might come back. Nope. His approach at 18 was good, but would leave him needing to sink a long putt for birdie and require a Goosen mistake. Goosen cleared his first obstacle safely off the tee at 18. This ball going down the center of the fairway, John. It's just a matter of if it'll stay there. That's a 
pretty gutsy shot there. It'll go off the fairway, but in the light stuff, I think. Couldn't place it out there any better. Up ahead, Mickelson for birdie. Get in the hole! How's it looking? That narrow miss for birdie left Mickelson with a few feet to tap in for par. He finished the day one over and was left to ponder 17 and wait to see how Goosen would finish. Caps off a week he will not forget. All Goosen would need to do was make bogey or better to win the championship. His approach at 18, a nine iron from 153, put him in perfect position to seize the title again. All he needed to do was get home safely in three putts or less. made him just the 21st player to win multiple opens. His final round was remarkable given the conditions. One over on the day, but he needed only 24 putts with 11 one putts and beat Mickelson by two. The third time Mickelson finished runner up in a U.S. Open. Our Mark Rolfing caught up with a disappointed yet still grateful second place finisher. Well, Mark, obviously I'm disappointed. I, I fought hard all day. I played some of the best golf I've ever played and still couldn't couldn't break par. But boy, did Retief play well, play solid, and, and deserve to win. Your thoughts on what happened out at 17? Well, that's just, uh, I, I really don't know what to say there. I hit the putt pretty easy, and, and uh, it was downwind. And when the wind gets a hold of a ball on these greens, it just rolls it uh, quite a ways by. And I thought I hit a pretty good putt coming back and, and thought that it might move a little left. And I think the wind brought it a little right. and. Just, uh, just missed them both. I guess I'm proud of the way I played. Just a little disappointed it wasn't enough. Congratulations on a great week. Thanks, Mark. Bob Costas was now with a two-time Open champion. Retief, first of all, congratulations. Back uh, in 2001 in Southern Hills in Oklahoma, you won uh, the U.S. Open for the first time in a playoff with Mark Brooks. On that occasion, your putter was almost your undoing. It saved you today. Yeah, I, uh, I putted well. Hold a few good putts coming down to down the stretch and uh, you know once Phil got it to four under four to we have go again gonna come out again on Monday to give myself a chance um, but uh, unfortunately he made that uh, five and 17 and I made a good up and down on the bunker and and uh, I just didn't want to three party 18th again that's all <laughs> the adjective that's often applied to you is unflappable it certainly was apt today you hit only six greens in regulation but you had 12 one putts and only 24 putts overall well I, I knew it was going to come down to that um, the way the course was starting to to dry out and uh, I knew it was going to come down to chipping and putting and uh, I was just grinding out and I was just kept trying to leave myself in places where I can have a chance of making my par putts and uh, everybody struggled the course wasn't easy as we know and uh, I'm just lucky to be on top even though you are a guy who's called unflappable, you couldn't have been unaware that the vast majority of the people here were rooting for somebody else. Um, oh, I didn't notice. Um, <laughs> 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 um, no, um, no, I knew, uh, I knew it was going to come down to really Ernie and Phil. Those are going to be the two guys I'm going to need to, to beat. And uh, I'm just very lucky to stand here with this trophy again. It's, uh, it's a great feeling. Your name has been etched on this trophy or will be twice. Quite an achievement. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Retief Goosen, the 104th U.S. Open champion. So for the second time in four years, Retief Goosen's name sat atop the leaderboard with an exhausted Phil Mickelson left to ponder what may have been. For the fourth time, Shinnecock was host to a classic championship whose eventual winner was determined in dramatic fashion on the final two holes. They say lightning doesn't strike twice. But for South Africa's Retief Goosen, who was struck by lightning when he was 17, nearly costing him his golf career, he carried with him an electric putter and shocked the golf world. 
Yes, lightning does strike twice as Ratif Gusin wins his second U.S. Open Championship.